This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you so much, Gary, for that uh, very nice introduction. And thank you to all of you for attending my talk today. I'm really excited to share a little bit about my research experience and, and thoughts I have going uh, forward as a vegetable breeder at, at Cornell. Uh, so I, I tried to tailor the talk more to, uh, for the pathology audience, but I'd like to start just by giving an overview of my current research program. Um, so I'm a tomato and eggplant breeder here at Cornell. Uh, there are three kind of overarching objectives of my lab's research. Those are to discover the genetic basis of traits of uh, coordinates, either to, to growers or consumers, to model strategies for, for how to implement new technologies in the context of a very applied cultivar development program, and then finally to develop and release varieties of tomato and eggplant that meet the needs of stakeholders in New York and the Northeastern United States. So I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about each of those objectives that keep trying to advance the slides with this. So in terms of cultivar development uh, for New York and the Northeast, uh, there are really diverse stakeholders, markets, and needs in our region. So talking about tomato, tomato is grown in open field, it's grown in high tunnels. Uh, also in our state, we have companies growing tomatoes in some of the most high-tech environments that tomatoes are grown in around the world. This is Green Empire Farms outside of Syracuse, where they grow tomatoes under 64 acres of glass. Tomatoes are grown for wholesale markets, uh, including at produce auctions, which is an important uh, outlet for many of the Amish and Mennonite growers in our region. They're grown and sold directly to consumers at farmers markets, and farm stands, and through CSAs. New York is also a state where over 90% of the population lives in urban environments. There are a lot of people interested uh, in growing vegetables in these environments, and there are a lot of needs to develop varieties that, that do well in those, in those distinct environments. Uh, finally, New York is a very diverse state, um, and there are many people uh, uh, in our state who are interested in growing crops that are important to their heritage. And eggplant is a really great uh, species uh, to meet some of those needs uh, because there's so many diverse types that people are, are used to from around the world. And one of those types is uh, the African eggplant or Salinum aethiopicum, seen here that my lab is starting some research on as well. So I mentioned I'm interested in testing how to implement new technologies in an applied vegetable cultivar development program. And uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in is genomic selection. And if, if you're familiar with that, genomic selection is the idea of, uh, of uh, combining genotypic and phenotypic information on what's called the trading population, using that information to develop statistical models, and then applying those models to populations of plants for which we might not have any phenotype information. We might not have ever observed their phenotypes, but we can actually predict their phenotypes based exclusively on molecular markers. This is a uh, technology that's been implemented in, in uh, pretty widely in breeding programs for agronomic crops over the past 10 years or so. But the adoption in vegetables has been a little bit slower for, for many reasons. Um, you know, one, I think traits in vegetables are more difficult to quantify, um, either because of the throughput, right? We can't drive a combine through a field and quantify yield on thousands of plots. We have to go out there and pick them multiple times through the season. And also some traits are just more intangible and difficult to turn into numbers. So, you know, really successful breeders can walk through their field and visually identify plants that are superior in terms of their growth habit, their fruit shape, their color. Those are things that are uh, more challenging to quickly turn into numbers. But uh, I'm really interested in working with uh, the expertise we have here on campus to kind of showcase how we can uh, implement these technologies in a, in a practical way. Uh, finally, uh, genetic discovery and pre-breeding. This, this has been one of the most important legacies of public sector vegetable breeders. Um, in tomato, you know, if you go to the farmer's market and look at tomatoes, you'll see such a variety of shapes and colors and sizes. But despite all that morphological diversity, there's actually pretty limited genetic diversity, especially compared to what's found in uh, the related species of domesticated tomato in uh, uh, in, in, in wild species endemic to South America. Uh, plant breeders have introduced, you know, so many genes of commercial importance from these wild species into domesticated tomato 
that if you look at commercially available varieties coming out now and compare them to commercially available varieties coming out 50 or 75 years ago, the genetic diversity is much greater because of how much wild species DNA has been introduced into tomato. Um, one of the projects that my lab is starting to work on is uh, working with Solanum cities, which is actually one of the most distantly related allied species of tomato. It grows in the Atacama Desert of Chile, which is a region uh, that receives on average like half an inch of rainfall a year. Uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable if you look at these pictures. These are landscapes that are like devoid of all plant life, but somehow miraculously there are like wild tomatoes growing there. Uh, for, for many years, this was a species that breeders didn't really have access to working with because of cross compatibility barriers. Uh, but recently, a team at UC Davis, uh, through a very uh, complex crossing scheme and many years of effort, were able to develop a set of introgression lines with DNA from this species in the background of domesticates made. And we're starting to look at that for some abiotic stress tolerances. Then, you know, the, the most important traits that have come from uh, wild tomatoes have been disease resistances. And, you know, in the rest of my talk, we're going to talk about how it's important to understand the genetics, not just of the host, but of the pathogen as well. Uh, you know, this, this is obviously not a novel concept at all. It's pretty fundamental, I think, to the field of plant pathology. It was demonstrated by Floor in the, in the 50s, working on flax and flax rust, who, who showed that the disease outcome depended on the genotype of the plant and also the genotype of the pathogen, which he summarized you know, very succinctly in his conclusion to this very seminal paper. Uh, but in terms of how I kind of like came around to this concept, you know, 70 years after everybody else did, uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about the research I did on Phytophthora capsaicae as a graduate student. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Phytophthora capsaicae, it causes a disease called Phytophthora blight. This is a disease that's very difficult to manage um, you know, for, for growers for a couple of reasons. It produces these thick walled resting spores. These are sexual spores that can survive in the soil for over 10 years, uh, dormant in the absence of a susceptible host. It also has a really explosive asexual life cycle. So these sporangia that you can see on the surface of this pumpkin fruit here, uh, in wet conditions, they differentiate into 20 to 40 moldable zoospores that in wet conditions can swim through water and identify a new host to infect. So phytophthora blight causes a range of disease symptoms, different disease syndromes. It causes damping off, it causes root and crown rot, it causes fruit rot, it affects solanaceous species, cucurbits, a couple of other important vegetable species. And one kind of consistent thing that we've seen with phytophthora blight is that Often it's introduced to farms in floodwaters. Um, so a farmer may have no experience with this disease. There will be a really severe uh, rainfall event. A neighboring you know, body of water will flood. And then a week or two later, they'll see you know, really uh, severe uh, crop loss in their fields. Once it's introduced, it's pretty much impossible to eradicate. And unfortunately, with the you know, change that we see in our weather, weather patterns, it seems like it's becoming more and more common. So when I started my PhD, I, I came into an ongoing project on breeding for resistance to squash at, at that time. And, and actually still today, there's really no commercially available resistance in squash to phytophthora root and crown rot. This was a project that was a collaboration between uh, Chris's lab and, and Michael Mazurk's uh, vegetable breeding program. The methods that, that we used for uh, selecting resistance were pretty straightforward, but, but very effective. We would grow our populations of seedlings in the greenhouse, inoculate them with the suspension of zoospores, and then a week or two later, you know, sort through all those dying plants and find the ones that were the most green, and pop those up and use those for more crossing. Uh, and, and like I said, this, this worked pretty well. Uh, we put the results of this project into field trials. Uh, here you can see a susceptible zucchini cultivar, uh, or maybe you can't see it because the plants are pretty much dead at this point, a couple of weeks after inoculation. Uh, this is actually the source of resistance that was used in this resistance breeding program. You can see it has somewhat of an intermediate phenotype. And then the lines that we developed uh, actually had a resistance level superior to the resistant parent. Uh, unfortunately, in the process of selecting, you know, more or less exclusively based on seedling 
resistance, we lost a lot of the traits that make it good as a zucchini, but uh, we, we did show that you can select for resistance to the top of the rule. I spent a lot of time in the greenhouse inoculating seedlings and associating variation in uh, the disease response with variation uh, in the DNA polymorphisms and identifying QTL related to resistance. Uh, within several different experiments, we mapped a total of six QTL related to Phytophthora crown and root rot resistance. We found that these QTL individually uh, had very small effect. Uh, if you look at these plots, these are showing the allelic effects of markers in these regions. Uh, and if you look at their effect on relative AUDBC, it's very slight. And individually, these markers explain anywhere from like 2 to 10% of the phenotypic variation. Um, however, collectively, uh, you know, they can make pretty big differences. So, uh, you know, when you increase the number of QTL that are fixed for the resistant allele, uh, lines that had five of these resistant uh, Q, resistance QTLs compared to lines that had zero had pretty substantial difference in terms of their disease response. That being said, you know, this is pretty challenging for a breeder to work with um, because, you know, uh, a breeder's not just selecting for these five genes. There's probably many more genes that we weren't able to map that are even of smaller effect. They're selecting for uh, resistance to other diseases, growth habit, fruit shape, shelf life. Uh, even when selecting for like a single qualitative R gene, often it's difficult because of the other genes that tend to come along with it. So selecting for five small effect genes uh, is really, really challenging. One, one thing that wasn't challenging about uh, phytophthora root and crown rot resistance in squash was that it was really consistent across different strains of the pathogen. Uh, so here you can see disease incidence over time in, in two varieties. Um, our resistant breeding line and a susceptible zucchini check. The different line types are different strains of the pathogen. We did this a few times with different strains, both from around New York and around the country, and we found pretty similar results consistently. It didn't really matter uh, what strain was we inoculated with. Uh, they all caused similar levels of disease, and there were no interactions. Right? The resistance level of the plant genotype was not conditional on which isolate it was challenged with. So that, that's a very different case than the case in pepper, and I'm going to talk uh, more about that in depth. Um, the, the way that I became exposed to, um, you know, this phenomenon in pepper was through field trials at the Cornell Phytophthora Forum. So many of you probably know that in Geneva, uh, there are fields that are dedicated exclusively to research on Phytophthora blight. Uh, you know, Chris's lab uses those. Uh, for many research projects. And it's also a resource for breeders around the country uh, to conduct trials to see how their germplasm um, performs uh, in inoculated trials. So, so being Chris's student who worked on Phytophthora capsicea, I also had the uh, honor of managing some of these trials, which was uh, a really excellent learning experience. Uh, but it was also something that we, you know, that there were challenges as well. Uh, if you look at this picture, you can see my lab mate at the time, Allie, she's, she's dumping Phytophthora infested vermiculite into every single hole that we're going to transplant our pepper seedlings into. I would then go back through like two or three times over the next several weeks and spray each plant with a suspension of zoospores. But still, often by the end of the season, we would have fields that look like this. Um, Breeders would, would want to come out and select their most resistant plants, but everything would look really healthy. Uh, it wasn't always easy to get disease. We started to suspect that it may be because of the isolate that we were using. So this is like a typical result uh, that we would see with um, the isolate that we had been using. Uh, we've killed maybe 1,000 out of 2,500 plants, which I guess, I guess isn't bad, but still some of the breeders we worked with were frustrated. They wanted to see more differences and select more plants, especially in the early generation material. So the, uh, in 2018, we decided to use a different isolate. I'll talk more about how we found that isolate. Um, but here we actually like had the opposite problem. Uh, by the end of the season, only 150 of the 2,800 plants we put in that field had survived. Uh, this was honestly probably worse than the result we had in the first case. The breeders weren't able to select any plants because all the plants were, were dead. Uh, 
So how, how did we discover that isolate that we inoculated that field with? Uh, in the winter between uh, uh, field seasons in 2017 and 2018, I went to the lab and grabbed just 30 cultures, you know, somewhat randomly from uh, Chris's uh, culture collection, inoculated them onto three different bell pepper hybrids with different kind of overall levels of resistance. And I was really amazed by how much variation that we saw in terms of the disease caused by these isolates, uh, ranging from, you know, strains that were only able to kill a, you know, a small number of the most susceptible variety so strains that caused high levels of disease in all three of the varieties, including Paladin, which is uh, marketed in seed catalog, so it's resistant to Phytophthora. If you see here, um, where is it? Let's see. 0664-1. So this is the strain we had been using in the field trials. We went all the way to the right side of the plot to 1455 for the next year's trial. You know, in hindsight, we probably should have gone somewhere in the middle and not uh, all the way to the other extreme. But, you know, th this was a, a really uh, interesting, I guess, revelation for me. You know, th the reason that I got into plant breeding was because I was so fascinated by phenotypic diversity in crop plants and vegetables especially. And to realize that there was all this phenotypic diversity in microbes as well, uh, you know, just really, really struck me. I, mean, I, I started to become more interested like less in the differences between the plants and more in kind of the differences between the strains, right? Like I wanted to know what, what was it about this strain that enabled it to cause disease on paladin and this strain uh, uh, unable to do that. So I was really lucky to have access to uh, lots of excellent resources in Chris's lab. So, you know, we had a, a culture collection with hundreds of isolates of Phytophthora capsaicea. There had been previous grad students who had worked on this pathogen and worked out like a lot of uh, the details that were needed to do these experiments. So Chris's student Amara Dunn developed like really excellent protocols for culturing and using inoculum and doing inoculations with this pathogen. Uh, we also had experience with high density gene typing in phytophthora capsaicea. A lot of those bioinformatic pipelines were developed by Chris's student, uh, Marin Carlson. So I was able to kind of put these things together and think about how to answer some of the research questions I had. And I thought, you know, could we genotype maybe the culture collection uh, with high density SNP markers, inoculate it onto a series of different pepper varieties, and then identify markers associated with variation and virulence on these different pepper varieties. So, so that's, that's what we, did, uh, the, the first thing we had to do was uh, assemble our culture collection. Uh, many of these cultures, you know, we already had um, in store. They, they had been collected at some point over the previous 10 years or so. Chris also had really excellent relationships with growers and extension specialists. We were able to go and collect more strains. Uh, it was actually kind of like a, almost like a, like a treasure hunt. Like I remember going to Wegmans and finding a rotting zucchini and bringing it to the lab and, and being like amazed to pull Phytophthora capsaicea out of. Uh, so it was fun to kind of expand the, this, this culture collection. In, in this plot, you can see the different sites that the strains came from. Each circle is like a different field, and the size of the circle is proportional to how many strains we collected out of that field. We also got a small number of strains from other states as well. So we genotyped the strains with gene typing by sequencing, which is uh, a reduced representation whole genome sequencing approach. It's, it's a way to basically assay SNPs at thousands of sites uh, across the genome. Um, one thing that we could do with this data was uh, we looked at the pairwise genetic similarity between all of our isolates. And when you do that and you make a histogram of all those pairwise genetic similarities, you get this uh, trimodal distribution. And, and what, what that is, is that this peak here of pairs of isolates that are least related to each other, these are isolates from different field sites. The peak in the middle, these are isolates that are um, genetically distinct, but from the same field sites, so related to each other. And then we have this peak all the way at the right, close to 100% genetic similarity. That includes technical replicates of the same isolate sequence multiple times, which also told us that pairs of isolates that appear here are likely clonally derived from the same common ancestor. So we could use this to identify different clonal groups of Phytophthora capsaicea in our isolate uh, collection. 
One thing that we found, which made sense with the biology of the pathogen, was that every clonal group was unique to a particular field and year, uh, you know, which uh, is what we expected given that the asexual spores are very short-lived, whereas the sexual spores, the product of meiosis, are the ones that overwinter from year to year. So, you know, just looking at one isolate per clonal group and looking at the population structure of this collection of isolates, here if you look at the uh, principal components analysis plot on the left and the neighbor joining tree on the right, the different colors represent different regions of New York and the different symbols within a color are different field sites. Um, and what we found was that in almost every case, uh, an isolate from a particular field site was more likely to be uh, closely related to another isolate from that same field site than to another isolate in our collection. And this was even true at really uh, small spatial scales. So if you look at these purple triangles here and these purple circles here, these came from two fields in Western New York that were separated by about a mile. Uh, you can see that they're more closely related to each other than they are to any of the other isolates that we sequenced, but they're still totally differentiated from one another. So just this really interesting, um, you know, uh, example of how these like pretty rare founder events of how these these populations are introduced to fields uh, end up contributing to pretty strong genetic differentiation over time through drift or selection. Another thing that we found was evidence of it seemed like you know uh, pretty widespread chromosomal copy number variation. Uh, the way we could look at this was by looking at uh, read depths, uh, sequencing read depths, and in particular read depths for heterozygous sites. So if you, if you sequence a heterozygous site, uh, on average you should expect about half of the reads that you sequence to belong to one allele and the other half to belong to the other allele. There will be some noise because of you know sampling. Uh, but if you look at a histogram of all the sites across the genome that are heterozygous for a particular isolate, you should expect like a normal distribution centered around 0 0.5. And that's what we saw for some of the isolates. For other isolates, we saw, you know, bimodal distributions with peaks at 0 0.33 and 0 0.66. These are likely genome-wide triploids. We also saw evidence of tetraploids or possible higher uh, copy number uh, isolates. We, we, we don't have a, a chromosome level reference genome for Phytophthora capsaicae, but there had been a genetic map published before. We were able to anchor our SNP markers to that genetic map to assign them to linkage groups, which you can think of you know, essentially as chromosomes. And it was really interesting to see that even within a genome, we saw all this copy number variation. So for this particular isolate here that I'm showing, uh, you know, 16 of its uh, chromosomes appear to be diploid, and then it has two chromosomes that it seems to have in, uh, three copies of. And, you know, this was really widespread, um, didn't really seem to be much uh, patterns. All of the linkage groups were, uh, we found to, to be triploid or of a higher ploidy level and at least one isolate. Uh, we did find a couple of linkage groups that, that had the highest incidence of higher uh, ploidy levels. Uh, but, but one thing that I think was interesting about this was that it, it appears that this amyploidy was mitotically derived as opposed to meiotically derived. Uh, and the reason that I think that is because within a certain clonal group, we would find individual isolates that would be amyploid for a chromosome, and that wouldn't be shared by other isolates within that same clonal lineage. Uh, so it seems like this, you know, like widespread uh, variation arises very spontaneously and very rapidly in populations of photography capsules. So we, we assay all of our isolates for mating type by co-culturing them with isolates of known mating type uh, and checking for the presence of oospores. Um, we use that as a phenotype in a genome-wide association study. So if you look at the Manhattan plot here on the x-axis, it's basically chromosomal location. Typically, there'll be alternating colors for chromosomes, but again, like we don't have chromosome level assembly, so they're scaffolds of the genome assembly. And then the y-axis, the negative log 10 p-value. So the higher the point, the higher the association with that, that phenotype. Uh, we saw a strong peak on scaffold four. This trait had been mapped by others in experimental crosses. They found the same result, a region on scaffold four that determines main type. Uh, we also corroborated previous results that show that the A1 isolates uh, had one haplotype at that locus, 
and the A2 isolates had two haplotypes. So it seemed that uh, mating type and phytophthora capsicine, this has been shown in, in other uh, Oomycete species, appears to be inherited analogously to like an XY sex determination species, uh, such as in animals. So we also uh, assayed the isolates for resistance to the fungicide uh, methanoxin, which uh, was used, I think, for the first time in the 70s, I believe, and you know, resistance showed up shortly after that in uh, Oomycete species. And this trait hadn't been mapped before in Phytophthora capsicine. We found a strong peak on scaffold 62. It had been assumed for a long time that the target site of methanoxin was RNA polymerase 3. Uh, because methanoxin interferes with our ribosomal RNA synthesis uh, in all my seeds. We didn't find any genes annotated as subunits of RNA polymerase 3 in that, in that region. But what we did find was this gene RRP5, which is a gene involved in assembling pre-ribosomal RNA into a ribosome. So it seemed to us like a pretty strong candidate for the target side of methanoxin. And since we published this, actually, uh, uh, Crossing experiment in Phytophthora infestans has implicated the, the same gene in uh, metal axon resistance. So the, the, the GWAS results for mating type and methanoxin resistance were very promising. Uh, we were very excited to you know, use the same approach for virulence on, on different, different pepper varieties. So we started to generate that phantopic data. Uh, we took a subset of 117 isolates that were genetically unique from our isolate collection. And we challenged those onto 16 different varieties of peppers. These were both commercial hybrids and lines that have been used by others as differentials for phytophthora capsicin. We evaluated plants for incidence of mortality over time, turned that into AUDPC. Altogether, this was about 1,900 unique combinations of host and pathogen. So it, it was quite a bit of phenotyping. And we, we repeated this twice for most combinations. So, you know, I guess the first question is like, were there interactions between pathogen isolate and pepper variety or accession? And the NOVA table says yes, but it doesn't really tell us much about the nature of those interactions. We wanted to kind of characterize the pattern of those interactions. So, you know, we tried to visualize this in a couple of different ways. If, if you look at this plot, uh, each subplot represents a different isolate. On the x-axis are the different pepper varieties increasing in order of susceptibility from left to right. In each plot, the, the black dash line is the average level of disease caused, you know, across all isolates on a particular pepper accession. And then the red line is the level of disease caused by that particular isolate. Um, so kind of, you know, kind of a lot to like take in, but a couple of things that uh, we noticed looking at this data. Uh, one is that on average, the disease caused by a particular isolate tends to increase with the overall susceptibility of a pepper uh, accession. Although there were some cases where that wasn't the case, right? Like, like here. Another thing we saw was that there was a lot of uh, variation between isolates that came from the same location. Uh, so the background color of these plots indicates what site they came from in New York. Um, so like all these blue isolates came from one field, for example. If you look at this dark, these dark green squares, these were two different isolates that came from a squash field in Long Island. You'll see that one caused, you know, fairly average levels of disease on all, on all the pepper varieties. And this other isolate from the same location caused very high levels of disease uh, across the board. You know, we, we wanted to kind of uh, find ways to characterize this variation more. And because I'm trained as a plant breeder, I, I, I turned to, to methods used in, in plant breeding. Uh, so one thing that uh, I looked at is what we call virulence stability. Uh, so this is analogous to like yield stability analysis that's used by plant breeders in analysis of gene type by environment interaction data. So that the idea is you, you evaluate different varieties of a, of a crop in different environments, and then you can look at how stable the performance of those varieties is across the environments uh, by regressing the individual variety yield on the average yield for each environment. Uh, the the like good uh, example of this 
um, would be like a variety that's very responsive to fertility. Uh, that variety would have a very high slope in this analysis. It would perform very poorly in low fertile environments and it would perform very well in highly fertile environments. Whereas a variety that's more stable would just have kind of a more uh, intermediate uh, performance across the board. So the way that we looked at this, we basically treated isolates as crop varieties um, and pepper hosts as environments and uh, regress disease caused by individual isolates on the average disease seen on the pepper varieties. Um, when you do that, you kind of see that isolates fall into one of three categories, uh, low slope and low intercept. Those are isolates that cause low levels of disease across the board. Low intercept and high slope, those are isolates that tend to cause average levels of disease on all of the pepper accessions. And then isolates with high intercept and low slope, those are isolates that cause high levels of disease on all peppers. Uh, you know, that tells us something. And then another parameter that you can get from this model is the mean square error. It's like, how well can you predict the disease caused by an isolate as a linear uh, uh, relationship with the overall susceptibility of the host. And in most cases, you can predict it very well. Uh, most isolates have a low mean square error, but there were a few that, that had a really high mean square error. In other words, you, you couldn't really tell how it was going to, what kind of disease it would cause in a pepper accession, uh, knowing solely the overall susceptibility level of that pepper. Okay, we, we next tried to look at the association between pathogen subpopulation and these virulence phenotypes. Um, so here I'm showing the principal components analysis of the genotypic data, the molecular marker data. And we use K-means clusters to I assign isolates to one of five clusters. And then we regressed virulence on each individual pepper variety uh, as, a, as a function of their you know, assignment to those clusters. And in most cases, what we found was that the genetic subpopulation of isolate didn't really influence how much disease it could cause on most of these pepper varieties, with the exception of red night, the most susceptible pepper on average in our experiment. But we started looking at multivariate phenotypes and we saw, we saw a very different uh, uh, conclusion. Excuse me. So this is the principal components analysis of the phenotypic data. So the matrix of disease outcome uh, for all the isolates on all of those different pepper accessions. Uh, principal components one and two explain most of the variation in our data set. Uh, principal component one was very highly correlated with just overall average virulence across all the pepper accessions. That wasn't associated with cell population. Principal component two uh, was very highly correlated with the slope from that stability analysis. So like the uh, increase in virulence as a function of pepper susceptibility uh, also wasn't associated with subpopulation. The principal component three had a very strong association with pathogen subpopulation. And you, you can see here that along this x-axis, uh, denoting principal component three, uh, you know, all the isolates belonging to genetic cluster, the green cluster, are fall on the left side of that axis and all the isolates on the belonging to the, the blue cluster fall on the right side of that axis. This principal component is more difficult to interpret, uh, but if you look at the loadings of the individual uh, pepper variety variance data on that principal component, uh, the, the way I interpret it, I'm not sure this is like correct, but it's basically uh, measuring how much disease the isolates cause on the intermediately resistant pepper accessions uh, controlled by their, uh, the disease causing the most susceptible pepper accessions. So if you look at the individual plots belonging to the isolates with the most extreme values on that principal component, uh, so this would be that green dot over here, and this isolate would be that blue dot over here, you can see that, that this isolate causes lower than average disease on the most, most resistant and most susceptible pepper variety but much higher than average disease on the intermediately resistant pepper varieties. Whereas this isolate causes higher than average disease on the most susceptible and the most resistant pepper variety, but much lower than average disease on the intermediately resistant pepper varieties. Uh, I, th I think what this means is that there are uh, host-specific virulence variants that affect 
the disease observed on these intermediately resistant pepper varieties, but you can't really piece that out unless you control for much larger effect variants affecting their ability to cause disease on the most susceptible uh, pepper exceptions. So, you know, like we do with megatype and fungicide sensitivity, we did a genome-wide association study. We found four loci that were significantly associated with virulence. In all cases, these four loci were associated with broad spectrum virulence. So the, the virulence allele at these loci resulted in higher disease on all of the pepper exceptions that we tested. Uh, we weren't able to map any variants that affected disease on only individual pepper accessions. And when, when we look at the genes in the regions of these hits, uh, we found annotations that kind of support a virulence function. So these are kind of close-ups of those Manhattan plot peaks, and the track underneath shows um, gene annotations and alternating colors. Uh, the red genes our RXLR, RXLR effector genes, you can see that in the case of the peak on scaffold 39, the peak that was actually inside one of these effectors seems like a pretty strong support that this, you know, there's actual um, a virulence function for this hit. Uh, similar to scaffold 37, although more in the gene. Um, the purple sequences are polyglacturonase uh, gene annotations. So genes involved in cell wall degradation. And in, in the case of the end of scaffold 93, we saw that there was a cluster of genes annotated as having a, a polyglateronous uh, role. Okay, so what, what's the make of these results? Like, it, you know, we, we generated a lot of data and like kind of scratched our heads and tried to tell some story about it and make sense of it. Uh, what are the actual practical implications? I, th I think for one thing, we showed that, you know, GWAS works pretty well for candidate gene identification and sexually reproducing pathogens. Um, we showed that both for the main type, for the fungicide sensitivity, and in the case of this larger effect, virulence loci that affected all of the pepper accessions in our experiment. You know, other breeders and pathologists use the terminology physiological races to refer to Phytophthora capsaicy populations. Based on the set of isolates and the set of pepper accessions we included in our experiment, I'm not sure I would use that terminology. To me, that implies like large effect qualitative gene for gene interactions that influence the presence or absence of disease. We saw evidence for much smaller quantitative uh, gene for gene interactions that influence relative disease levels on different varieties. Uh, I'm not sure what the best way is to classify you know, isolates or strains. Based on the data that we observed, I, I don't think there is an easy way to do it, but physiological races, I think, maybe is an oversimplification. That being said, you know, maybe with a different set of isolates, different set of host gene types, we would have had different uh, conclusions. So, you know, like I said, we were able to identify virulence variants with uh, medium to large effect across all of the uh, pepper hosts in our experiment. Uh, but we couldn't really, we knew that there was there were variants that had an effect on individual pepper varieties, but we couldn't pick those out. Uh, we probably were just underpowered because of small, you know, relatively small sample sizes. In terms of implications for pepper breeding, you know, if I was a pepper breeder, what would I do knowing this information? I, I think I would just treat the resistance to different strains like a correlated trait. You know, in terms of screening early generation lines, I'd probably evaluate them against one isolate, uh, one strain of the pathogen, and then as I move forward and and evaluate more advanced lines, I would test them against an increased number of isolates. So how, how am I going to take this like background and move forward as an eggplant and tomato breeder? I'll try to do this in like two minutes. Um, I think it really just depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so as an example, tomato leaf mold is a disease that's really important in our region in high tunnels. And it's also a disease that has been very well characterized by molecular plant pathologists. Many R genes and avirulence loci in the, in the fungus have been cloned. Here, there's very strong evidence of you know, very clear qualitative gene for gene interactions. Uh, I, I worked a little bit on this as a, a grad student in a project led by my lab mate, Martha Suderman. Uh, we characterized isolates from around the state, uh, race type them. We determined that everything that we found were races zero and two. Uh, tomato breeders tend to use one resistance gene, CF9, in resistance breeding programs. That works against those races. So for the time being, I think uh, resistant varieties should hold up. 
but I think it's also prudent to maybe pyramid additional uh, resistance genes as well, anticipating uh, breakdown. My predecessor in my position, Martha Mutchler, did a lot of excellent work on early blight and sectorial leaf spot, identified new sources of resistance to these diseases. Um, there's really nothing known about the population structure of the, of the fungi that cause these diseases. Do they reproduce sexually? How much variation is there between strains in the same field, between fields? Uh, does the resistance hold up equally to different strains? Uh, there's, you know, there's really a lot of unknowns, and I think a lot of information that would be valuable there. Uh, my lab is also working on verticillium resistance. Um, if you, if, you know, when, when I ask eggplant uh, growers and extension agents what the biggest problem in eggplant is, if I ask 10 people, they all tend to tell me the same thing, which is verticillium, which is good to hear as a breeder so I can kind of focus. Um, there's no resistance available to verticillium in eggplant. In tomato, verticillium has been controlled for, I don't know, 50 or 80 years with a single gene. Uh, VE that's been overcome in other parts of the country. Uh, we don't know if there's uh, you know VE um, uh, strains that overcome VE in New York. I think that's a, a valuable question to answer. We also don't know how much that doesn't matter for eggplant. Uh, does is there association between virulence and eggplant, virulence and tomato? I think there's uh, important questions to answer there. So to, to conclude, you know. Uh, as a vegetable breeder moving forward, I, I don't think for every single disease I work on, I'm gonna uh, test you know, my breeding lines against 100 strains of, of the pathogen. But I, th I think there are, are some uh, important lessons, right? Like the scale and scope of pathogen monitoring characterization depends on the particular case. In the case of tomato leaf mold, it might be monitoring for, for individual avirulence genes that are already cloned that we know will allow them to overtake that deployed R gene. In the case of Septorian early blight, I think there's much more fundamental information that needs to be uh, uncovered first. Uh, I don't expect to do like any of this by myself. I really look forward to collaborating with pathologists. And another thing that I'm really interested in is you know, coordinating networks to test germplasm in geographically diverse locations, right? Because one thing we can do is do artificial inoculations in the greenhouse with different strains of the pathogen. But we can also just test germplasm in different locations and rely on natural inoculum and look at how durable resistance is um, with that approach. So with that, I'd like to thank all the people who contributed to my PhD research that I talked about today, as well as uh, the members of my lab currently, Raleen DeYoung, Cameron Downey, Howard Rice, and uh, Ivana Castillo. So with, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions if, if there's any time left. Question in the room here, and then we'll go to uh, yeah. Um, back to Phytophthora. How much sexual reproduction occurs in the field? Um, pretty much in in it. so the question for Zoom was uh, how much sexual reproduction occurs in the field with Phytophthora capsaicea. Uh, almost in every case, when we sample strains from the field, we identify both mating types. And the genotypic data also supports, you know, very frequent sexual reproduction. So uh, it tends to be uh, the case that both mating types are present, and uh, sexual reproduction is necessary for overwintering, which which we see as well. Yes. First off, I want to say that graft subplots are for the pepper results are probably the best. Representation of the total data that I've heard is very close. Cool. Uh, the question is cross the pepperine tests. Do you have a sense of how much zygosity for people with the pepperine? Uh, so, so, so th thank you, uh, Adam. The, the, the question was. Um, in the different pepper lines that we tested, how much heterozygosity is present in those lines? That, that's a good question. So we used a mixture of commercial hybrids and open pollinated pepper varieties. Um, the commercial hybrids should be, you know, pretty homogeneous. Um, and we saw pretty consistent results. In some of the open pollinated varieties that we Included, we did see more variable results, and there, there could be some heterogeneity within those. Yeah. No. There, there are a couple of questions. Uh, question from uh, Ricky. 
Do you think sparse testing methods would help alleviate the experimental constraints of challenging all gene types by all isolates? Or do you think the level of pathogen variation you observe in the field will hinder this? That, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I guess the, the answer is, is yes. Um, uh, that, that's not the way that we set up the experiment. Um, but I think it is possible to like leverage relationships between the isolates to not necessarily phenotype all combinations, but generate useful information. Um, and then there's a, another question, uh, and that is that when we've seen the history of plant breeding, breeders have been pretty successful in breeding for disease resistance, even though they have little knowledge of the type of isolates they work with. From this, can we conclude that they have been mostly selected for broad spectrum resistance? And how does this interaction carry over in time? That's that's a great question too. Um, and I, I I think I would say that that there are many cases of breeders deploying a resistance gene and that resistance gene lasting for decades. But there are also many cases of breeders deploying a gene and it lasting a year or two, right? I think both of those things have, have been observed. Um, well, the last question is from uh, Marina. Can you elaborate a little on possible pros or cons of using scaffold level sequences for GWAS rather than chromosomal level? Uh, if, you know, if, if we have chromosome level uh, assembly, that would be preferable. It's, it's, it's visually, it's nicer. And then we can also identify, uh, you know, whether different hits are, are linked on the same chromosome. Uh, it's very hard with, with many very small scaffolds that, that could actually be physically or genetically very closely linked. Um, and I guess that's it for the questions. Oh, Bill might have one. Um, is there no sexual reproduction in the phytophthora? Is there so, that? Yeah, that's. Is there sexual reproduction in the Geneva phytophthora farm? So, uh, yes, uh, you know. Chris in the past has intentionally inoculated that field with, with multiple uh, mating types with the intention of really studying, you know, how allele frequencies change over time in a sexually reproduce, reproducing population. But for field trials, we, we intend to inoculate only, only with one mating type, hoping not to contribute to, uh, you know, long lasting populations. So in those trials, there's no risk control population. That, that is the hope, but you know, uh, for all of our best efforts to contain pathogens, they they find a way to, to spread around. Um, yeah. I have one more question. Yes. In that massive study you did with your, the range of isolates over the several hosts, how stable were those aggressiveness or mm. that's that's a that's an excellent question. I apologize for not repeating the earlier questions. The question was how stable were the phenotypes, uh, uh, the, the aggressiveness levels of the isolates? That, that's, a, that's a really good question and, and one that I didn't talk about. Um, what, we, what we found generally was that the lowly and the kind of intermediately aggressive isolates were stable uh, across you know, different uh, replicates. But the isolates that tended to cause very high levels of disease on all of the pepper accessions, those were the least stable. Um, you know, we would inoculate with a strain and we would see, you know, very severe, uh, you know, plant uh, death. Uh, we'd be able to repeat that maybe a few times. Um, and then it would just, it would lose its its virulence. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it, I think there's a lot of spontaneous variation like that in phytophthora species. And we heard a little bit about that last week in terms of uh, fungicide sensitivity uh, as well from, from Sylvia. I think there's a lot of interesting questions there. Yeah. So we want to thank you again, Greg, for an excellent presentation and this has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.